All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Alper. I'm the Education Content Manager for this year's Code Day Labs. I'm happy to welcome Ravi Budruk, and he will be talking to you guys about computer architecture, current and future uh, of computer architecture and computer hardware. So, Ravi, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little more and then get started, that'd be great. Well, okay. Hi, folks. I'm assuming all of you can hear me clearly. And if you can't, well, raise your hand or indicate so to Alper Gill, who is, uh, who is the moderator. So my name is Ravi Budruk. I'm a owner of a company called Mindshare. You can see our company logo here. Uh, so Mindshare is an interesting small training company. We travel around the world. Prior to COVID, we traveled around the whole world going to various corporations, uh, teaching engineers, experienced engineers about next generation of computer architecture and any developments in the computer field. Now we learned our information from corporations which created the content like Intel, like Hewlett Packard, Cisco, Apple. These are our clients, but we also, Mindshare, learned our technical information from their engineers who were at the forefront of technology. Um, these companies would publish specifications which Mindshare, we would learn very quickly, synthesize and create PowerPoint presentations, which we would then um, sell, so to speak, as our training expertise. We would then travel to a, a company uh, that had invited us. They would pay us to provide this consulting uh, capability and we would go to that corporation and teach a class. Well, of course, with COVID, we now teach mostly online, but hoping that early next year sometime we will start going back into corporations to teach. So my job is a technical engineer, computer engineer. My training was uh, completing a master's degree at Purdue University. And then after that, I was a computer engineer designing microchips and microprocessors for the first five to 10 years of my career. And then for the last 15, 20 years, I have been teaching computer engineering related subjects. So that's a little bit of a, about my background. Um, Alper approached me asking if I would teach a class on any subject of choice. So I had to figure out, okay, how do I take some of what I already teach and pare it down to information that, you know, you guys will be able to understand and digest and would be beneficial to your understanding. So Alper explains to me that most of you are either, you know, juniors or seniors in high school or including uh, maybe freshmen and sophomore in college. So given that background, I think uh, most of you are interested obviously in computer engineering, computer architecture, and you're already familiar with terms like cache, CPU, DRAM, DDR, memory, um, and so on. So I'll make those assumptions that you understand some basic computer terminology and that no, you're not coming into this one hour lecture with uh, in, in no knowledge in, on computer engineering. If, if any of my assumptions and terms that I use are not familiar to you and you want to know what I just said or explain further what I assumed you knew, just raise your hand or type in a question and I'll be able to answer that, that question, okay? But otherwise, you know, I'll, I'll continue my lecture you may interrupt if you wish to, or wait till the end where we will have five to 10 minutes of Q&A. You can ask me to go to a certain slide. I'll go there and then you can ask your question and I'll answer your, I'll answer your question. How does that sound? All right. So before I present, you are going to get a PDF copy of this presentation that has about, I don't know, 30, 40 slides. Just wanted to tell you that there is a disclaimer, a legal notice, which is that you are allowed to use the presentation and the slides that you will get for your own personal use. What you're not allowed to do is email the PDF to your friends, uh, colleagues, or you're not allowed to copy the pictures exactly uh, and use them for your per for any kind of uh, you know personal professional use. You can review, as I said, use it for study keep a personal copy. That's pretty much it. If you ever need to contact me, that's my email address, training at mindshare.com, or you can phone this number and get a hold of me. All right. So what are we going to cover? Uh, the first set of slides you will find out 
is a review of the evolution of Intel microprocessors. Now, all of you know that Intel Corporation is a major corporation with over 100,000 employees, and they're the pioneers in microprocessor design. Now, there are other companies that design uh, microprocessors. There is Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, and there is ARM, uh, the ARM Corporation, which is based out of England. And then there are new companies that will be popping up that, that, that design microprocessors based on RISC-V technology or other RISC architectures. However, I am going to keep this talk limited to microprocessors that come out of the Intel Corporation. Um, and so hence, given their, they, the Intel is the major computer designer and manufacturer, I'm just going to go through a timeline of the evolution of their microprocessors right from the mid 80s when, or early 80s actually, when they produced their first microprocessor used in a computer up until today, all right? So we'll go through a timeline. Then after that, I'll show you some example platforms. I'll describe what you might find on a desktop machine. Then I'll show you what you might find on a laptop machine. And then show you one concept or explain one concept that you'll find in future servers about two to three years down the line, which will be our third example. But my focus is actually going to be on example number one. We'll spend most of our time on example number one, a desktop machine, less time on example two, and even lesser time on example number three. All right. So timeline. Okay. Hopefully all of you can see this slide here. Back before all of you were born, and I'm assuming all of you were born way after 1985. Back in 1985, I had just started college as a freshman, uh, taking a class in digital design and computer architecture. So right about then is when Intel produced their first microprocessor. You might have heard of the name 386, the 386 microprocessor. So this was Intel's first introduction to a processor which IBM back then decided to use over another competing processor from Motorola Corporation. IBM used this 386 microprocessor to create the first desktop machine that was ever used for personal use, for the PC use. And that desktop machine was called the IBM XT PC. So the 386 was used in that uh, desktop machine. And in that motherboard, or rather the motherboard that contained this 386 microprocessor had about 64 kilobytes of memory. And it had other peripherals and lots of microchips distributed throughout the motherboard. If you looked at a typical motherboard, which was about you know, 24 inches by 18 inches in size, you'd have seen the 386 microprocessor on it, the microchip, and lots of slots with 64 kilobytes only of memory. Today, we're used to hearing uh, a computer having 16 gigabytes of memory on, on DIMMs, but back then, we had only 64 kilobytes, you know, thousands of orders of magnitude, lower amounts of memory, with which we could do a lot. And then you had these other microchips, which were interconnect interconnectivity chips to connect the microprocessor to the various peripherals and memory. So that was our first microprocessor. Then a few years later, into Intel introduced a follow-on microprocessor, which is called the 486 microprocessor. Now this microprocessor included a small amount of a few kilobytes, about four kilobytes of very fast on-chip memory called cache, okay? So very fast on-chip memory called cache. Now cache, cache is made up of this, here you see this term cache. Cache is made up of very fast SRAM, static RAM memory, which is an order of magnitude faster than the external DRAM that you're familiar with. And this 
cache memory is inside the microprocessor chip itself. A 386 does not have cache. A 486 added cache to the microprocessor, allowing the processor then to be able to access external memory, take the content of that external memory, bring it into internal fast memory, and be able to access it at 10 times or on order of magnitude faster time than going out to access data that's in external DRAM memory, all right? So dynamic RAM, DRAM, is external memory that is an order of magnitude slower than the internal RAM or SRAM, which is what a cache is made up of. And that's what the 486 added to the evolution of the microprocessor. And back then, there is only one core or one, one microprocessor associated with the microchip, with the CPU. And this CPU would execute one instruction per clock, one instruction at a time. So the processor's job is to fetch code from DRAM memory, bring it in, cache it, and then execute on a 486, one instruction at a time. The next microprocessor thereafter is the Pentium processor, which came out in the 93 timeframe. Now the Pentium processor, the Pentium processor has the benefit that it can execute two instructions at a time. Right? It can execute two instructions at a time. So it, for the same clock rate, if you keep everything the same, it's almost like it's doubling the performance because it can execute two instructions at a time. However, it's two instructions of the same application or the same thread of code, right? So the processor fetches a thread of code and executes two instructions off that same thread of code. It is after all a microprocessor with one core that can execute two instructions in parallel, right? It still has just one cache. So that is the evolution on the, on the Pentium processor. Then we have another range of processors which Intel generically called the P6 or the sixth generation of processors. Intel stopped using the term, you know, 586 and 686 and 786. They used it for a short while, 386, 486, then went to names like Pentium and then P6, sixth generation. And from then on, we stop using the term with numerals, numbers, and instead have names for these Intel microprocessors, which is what you see in the slide timeline here is you see a list of names like Penryn and Nehalem and Westmere and Sandy Bridge and so on. These are names of future generation Intel processors and the timeline tells you where, when these microprocessors were uh, released. Now, the microprocessor communicates with the external chips using a bus which Intel called the front side bus. And this bus is a parallel bus made up of hundreds of wires or signals or pins that connect to the outside GNU logic, right? So the bus that the Intel microprocessor uses to communicate with external GNU logic or external chips outside the microprocessor is generically called the front side bus or FSB. And this bus is a parallel bus with lots of pins and signals in the range of, you know, two to 300 wires or pins. It's a parallel bus. I say this because future evolutions of the processor now have serial buses with far fewer signals, given that the communication is done serially rather than parallel data of bytes of data. You're sending the bytes instead in the form of bits serially. Uh, serial communication allows you to reduce the pin count on the package, as long as you can increase the clock rate at which you're sending those bits, which we are able to do. Now, earlier generation, uh, microprocessors run, ran at clock frequencies in the order of 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz, 300 megahertz. Today's microprocessors are running, are running at 1,000 times that clock rate in the range of gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz. So earlier microprocessors ran at hundreds of megahertz. Now that we're running at gigahertz. And you need to run at those high clock rates if you're expecting data to be sent serially rather than in parallel to the microprocessor, all right? Now, 
With the P6 processor, Intel decided to add not just one level of cache, but two levels of cache. Two levels of cache means that with the second level, you can add even more internal memory. Whereas the first level of cache only allowed you to have about four um, kilobytes or eight kilobytes of cache. With a second level, you can have 128 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes of um, cache memory. So level two, two levels of cache, cache memory. I'll leave it at that. Now let's go to the next slide. Next slide says you have now another generation of microprocessors starting with uh, the core processor in the year 2006. We have another category of Intel processors, a big jump in architecture. Um, and these are what Intel calls the core microprocessors. Uh, these core microprocessors, what they do is they bring what would have been in an external microchip like external graphics or external DRAM memory controllers. They take these two components which used to be on external chips and bring that into the same microchip as the microprocessor. So now a single microprocessor not only has the microprocessor functionality, but it also includes in it graphics functionality on the same silicon and also includes DRAM memory controller functionality on the same silicon. So we're integrating more hardware logic into the same piece of silicon that used to be traditionally purely a microprocessor. Now what that does is it blows up the transistor count or the number of transistors you'd find on a given piece of silicon, the size, the size of a thumbnail. So kind of the rule of thumb was to keep the size of the physical size of the silicon that you use in a microchip to that of a thumbnail, about uh, a square centimeter in size. Now, back in the early days of the 386, you probably had a few hundred thousand transistors. With the core microprocessor, you had uh, hundreds of millions of transistors. And that's possible because the process, the silicon process technology with which the, the transistors are designed has gone down significantly, all right? Now these core microprocessors, for example, are designed with a transistor whose gate size is 65 nanometers, right? I mean, I'm giving you some terms that just so you have them as a reference. So the transistor size, one single transistor size, the gate of that transistor, transistor for a core processor is about 65 nanometer. Today's microprocessors will be designed on 10 nanometers or even smaller transistors, right? So with 65 nanometers, we were able to put millions and millions of transistors on a single microchip the size of uh, one square centimeter, a thumbnail size. Uh, but today's microprocessors which are designed with 10 nanometer technology can have a couple of billion transistors on the same one square centimeter silicon size. All right, so more stuff. You've probably heard of the term Moore's law. So Intel had a challenge to the world and to itself that every year or every couple of years, they would double the number of transistors you would have on the same size silicon. And so far they've been able to meet their challenge as specified by the Moore's law. Uh, and that's allowing us today to have, as I said, the uh, current processors have few in the order of five to 10 billion transistors on a, on a given piece of silicon, the size of a thumbnail. All right, so the core microprocessor adds to the evolution of the processor, the ability to, to integrate graphics onto the same silicon and a memory controller onto the same silicon as the microprocessor itself, all right? I'm skipping forward. You can see here, I referred to that term, um, 65 nanometer. That's the process technology that the core processor is designed with. Now I'm gonna skip forward to a later processor, which was popular a few years back in the 2015 to 18 timeframe. And this is the Skylake microprocessor. Now these terms, you know, core, Penryn, Nehalem, Westmere, 
Ivy Bridge, Haswell, Broadwell, Skylake. You may not have heard of those terms because these are internal technical terms that Intel used between itself and its customers like Hewlett Packard or Dell computers um, and so on, or, or Lenovo. What the terms you may have heard as a consumer or user of computer computers is the term Core i3 or Core i5 or Core i7 and Core i9. These are consumer level terms, uh, but they're all really uh, terms that relate to the code name that Intel used with its customers, which is the Skylake microprocessor, all right? Now, by, by this time frame of 2015 to 2018, you can see that the microprocessors are designed using 14 nanometer process as opposed to 65 nanometers. So we have a huge shrink in the average transistor size down to 14 nanometer. And that's allowing us to put more transistors and more hardware, if you will, on a given piece of silicon. Now, at this time frame, Intel decided to split their microchip design into two categories, what Intel called core processors, and then the other category is Xeon microprocessors, the term Xeon. Core microprocessors, a core Skylake processor, for example, would be a microprocessor used in a laptop or a desktop machine. Whereas the Xeon microprocessor would be used in a server, a high-end workstation or a server machine. The computer architecture of that microprocessor is essentially the same, whether it's a core or Xeon, but the Xeon microprocessors support a huge amount of memory, uh, which is a requirement of a server compared to a core microprocessor that is used in a laptop or a desktop, all right? So the difference between a core versus a Xeon version of a given processor is that the Xeon supports large amounts of DRAM memory in the order of terabytes, whereas a core processor used for desktop and laptops supports smaller amounts of DRAM memory in the order of gigabytes of, of, of memory, right? So Intel introduced these Xeon processors that are used for high-end servers somewhere around this time frame. All right. And then we have uh, the next generation of processors, which are going to be released this year, end of this year, or early next year, All right? Intel classifies them as 12th generation processors, um, if, if you look at the evolution, 12th generation. And uh, the name of such a microprocessor would be Alder Lake or Sapphire Rapid. These processors have not been released yet. They will be released. And they're going to be designed on 10 nanometer super fin enhanced process. And more importantly, they will support a new type of memory, faster memory called DDR5, and a serial bus for communication called PCI Express 5, fifth generation PCI Express. Anyways, you may not be familiar with what is PCI Express. I will talk about this shortly. Uh, point being that we're going to have associated with this microprocessor for the next generation support of faster DDR5 memory. Currently, today's machines have DDR4 and PCI Express 3, but we will get to PCI Express 5 in the near future, all right? Another key addition to the microprocessor will be a very fast, low latency bus called Compute Express Link, CXL. You will not have heard of the term CXL or Compute Express Link because this bus this high speed, low latency bus is yet to be released to the public. It will be released next year or the year after. Uh, I teach a course on that. And um, so I'm gonna explain a little bit about what CXL, CXL is shortly. All right, let's go through platform examples. This is where you're going to see some pretty pictures or complicated pictures and things might be a little more interesting than going through a timeline. All right, so there are three examples, as I said, I'll be spending time mostly on explaining the basics of what you would find in a desktop machine. Then we'll spend a little time looking at a laptop machine and then a very small time on a next generation machine that includes a CXL link, okay? 
So here is our desktop machine. And it's based on, this desktop machine is based on a Coffee Lake processor that is an i9 based, core i9 based Coffee Lake processor, microprocessor. So here is the picture, all right? What you see on the top right hand side is an ATX motherboard. This is a motherboard whose size is about 12 inches by 9.6 inches. So a typical desktop would be built using this machine or rather this motherboard. And on this motherboard, you will see two very important sockets. One is shown on the left. This is the CPU socket. This is where the CPU microprocessor from Intel, <coughs> excuse me, will be plugged into. And then on the top right there, you will see a second chip called the PCH platform controller hub, uh, the 390 platform controller hub. That is the second chip also designed by Intel, but that chip is not a microprocessor. Instead, it contains a bunch of blue logic that allows the microprocessor to communicate with the peripherals such as an ethernet controller or a Wi-Fi controller or audio controller or whatever other peripherals like storage, uh, your SSD storage controller. So the PCH is a bunch of transistors in silicon that serves as glue logic or an interconnect between the main microprocessor that executes code and all of the various uh, peripherals. Now, visually, this socket is visualized here with a block diagram, right? Which is called the Core i9 microprocessor socket, all right? Now this package of silicon has a, associated with it approximately 1,100 pins. Land grid array, LGA means land grid array. It's basically a socket with a microprocessor in it. And that socket, if you look very closely, has over a thousand pins with which it communicates with external hardware like DRAM, DDR4 memory, like peripheral slots, like the video uh, device, the monitor. And then more importantly, this other second chip, which is called the PCH chip the Z390 PCH chip, all right? I'm clearing it. Here is your PCH and that's visualized here as that second chip. So Intel Corporation designs both of these chips and then a motherboard corporation like such as Hewlett Packard or Lenovo or Acer or Dell would then purchase these two chips, the microprocessor and the PCH, and connect them together on a motherboard, which is the ATX motherboard, which is then put into a packaging, which is what you see and you buy from, your, from the shop, which is a laptop packaging or a desktop packaging and sells it to the consumer with a label on top of it, which says whether the machine is an HP machine or a Dell machine or, or a Lenovo machine as an example, right? But the core hardware is coming from, the core microchips is coming from Intel Corporation. What you see on the north side is the microprocessor. What you see on the south side is the PCH glue logic microchip, all right? So if you have any questions, as I said, type your questions. Alper will read them out to me, but otherwise I will continue to the next slide. Now, let's focus on the microprocessor. You will notice that this microprocessor silicon, which is shown on the right side, but visualized on the left, has these boxes called cores. Now, there are eight cores in this example. The core i9 9 microprocessor has eight cores in this particular example. Now, eight cores, each core is capable of executing its own application software. What that means is if you have eight cores, 
That means in parallel, this microprocessor could be executing eight different applications at the same time. It's as if you're embedding eight microprocessors within the same silicon. Earlier processors like the 386 and the 486 would only have one core, all right? But then over the years, especially with core microprocessors, Intel started adding more cores into the same silicon. And more cores means more threads of code could be executing in parallel, um, giving you much better performance. So for example, the microprocessor would execute PowerPoint and Microsoft Word, and maybe a browser and the operating system all running in parallel on different cores, giving you the effect of a significant boost in performance. So with eight cores, you could be running eight threads of code in parallel, okay? This is what you need to understand about the microprocessor. Now, this slide also tells us that the microprocessor is running at a clock rate of 3.6 gigahertz. I said a 386 back then ran at tens of megahertz, but over the years, we have come up to a frequency of 3.6 gigahertz. And in turbo, turbo mode, the processor could be running at um, five gigahertz, for example. Now, one of the disadvantages of increasing the core clock rate is that the power consumed by the processor goes up. So, you know, we could run a microprocessor even faster if you wanted to. The problem is the battery life or the amount of power the, con the computer will consume goes up. Now, TDP, thermal design power, TDP, is a reference to how much power will that microprocessor consume at a maximum. And it says here, 95 watts of power. If you ran the clock too much faster than what I've shown, you start consuming more power and that's not a good thing. So we try to keep our power consumption on the microprocessor less than 100 watts. And if it's a laptop microprocessor, we want the power consumption even lower, otherwise your battery life won't be so long. You want to try and stay with a battery life of the order of eight hours of battery life if possible, all right? So TDP refers to the amount of power that microprocessor will dissipate. All right, now you can see here that, as I mentioned, although you have eight cores that execute the code that comes from DRAM memory, a CPU these days also includes graphics. GFX stands for graphics. So it also includes graphics. We have built-in graphics. In early generations of computers, the graphics uh, controller was a separate plug-in card or a separate chip. Intel decided to integrate the graphics to reduce cost, power consumption, and board real estate. But this graphics will have limited performance. If you are a gamer uh, and you think that the built-in Intel graphics performance is not good enough, you can always buy or use an external graphics card that will plug into one of these PCI Express slots that is external to the microprocessor. And these slots are connected to the microprocessor via a fast bus called PCI Express. PCI small e stands for PCI Express. It is a high speed serial bus that runs typically at a rate of eight giga transfers uh, per second or eight gigabits per second. And it can be used to connect to uh, an external graphics card, for example, used in a gaming machine. But for a laptop or a low end desktop, where you don't want to have an external graphics card, where an internal built-in graphics has good enough performance, Intel already has that built into the same silicon as the CPU, and that's labeled as GFX, all right? Now, this graphics controller has associated with it then an interface that allows you to connect to an external monitor via display port. DP stands for display port or HDMI. You can have an HDMI based monitor or display port based monitor. And so the microprocessor has signals or pins that connect via this connector, the DP connector or the HDMI connector to an external graphics uh, monitor, whether it be a laptop monitor or a desktop monitor, right? So that's what's shown there. DDI is digital, digital display interface is what the DDI stands for. Again, remember the box here is the microprocessor 
chip that plugs into that socket of the ATX motherboard. All right. Then you will see that the microprocessor includes built into the microprocessor is what is called IMC, which stands for integrated memory controller. That's the controller that communicates with the external DRAMs. Your laptops that you use at home probably have eight or 16 gigabytes of memory. That's the memory that we're referring to. DDR4 stands for dual data rate DRAM memory, fourth generation. The four is simply a reference to the generation and it's the fourth generation. Now, when you look at a motherboard, you will see these sockets there. These are called DIM sockets, dual inline memory module sockets. And it is in those DIMs that you plug in the DRAM memory sticks, which contain, for example, four gigabytes of memory per stick. So if you have four sticks, then you can have maybe 16 or even 32 gigabytes of memory. Now the memory, remember, itself is external to the microprocessor. The controller is in the microprocessor, but the memory itself is external to the microprocessor and the communication between the controller and the memory is done via a channel. It's called the DRAM channel. This is the DRAM channel. So there is a bus, an interconnect that the microprocessor uses to communicate with that external memory called the DRAM channel bus, all right? And- Ravi, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a question in the Q&A. Yes. If you'd like to answer. Uh, Kareem asked, how long do you think it will take DDR5 RAM to be widely adopted by the average consumer? Well, uh, so Intel does, has not yet released publicly a microprocessor that has DDR5. Now the, the memory manufacturers such as Samsung or Micron or um, um, Hitachi and so on have announced that they're going to release DDR5 DRAM memory to the public shortly. In fact, it's already released, but Intel doesn't have a microprocessor release because they are currently testing it. Um, the next generation microprocessor, the term that I used is Alder Lake or Sapphire Ridge. These next generation microprocessors that will, be, that will be released next year will have support for DDR5. So the IMC is a little bit behind in its design. I think you will start seeing computers that have DDR5 at the end of next year, 2022, all right? Because we're currently in the testing phase. Intel is testing DDR5 support. The DDR5 memory is available, but nothing to plug into yet. So we're looking at end of next year. All right, any further questions? So moving along, um, keep in mind again that the microprocessor is its own chip and the memory that comes in the form of DIMMs is a separate uh, memory uh, location that connects to the microprocessor via a DRAM memory channel. And it's the IMC memory controller that generates the transactions to communicate with that DDR4 or in the next generation DDR5 memory. All right. Typical amounts of memory on a desktop or a laptop today is about 16 gigabytes. And this Core i9 processor supports up to 64 gigabytes theoretically, okay? Now we have these numbers because it's a desktop or a laptop. For a Xeon equivalent machine, I mentioned the term Xeon. For a Xeon equivalent machine, the processors, the Xeon microprocessors will support terabytes an order of magnitude more memory than what is supported for desktop or laptops. All right. Ravi, we have one more question. I think there's a little bit of confusion around this topic. Okay. Uh, someone asked if RAM is separate from the cache. Is the RAM is separate from the cache? Yes. So let me bring up that term. I'm glad they brought it up. So you will notice, hold on. 
you will notice here that inside the microprocessor, I have this term here called L3 cache, L3 cache. Now, earlier when I talked about the 486, I said there was an L1 cache. And then on the Pentium microprocessor, they added a level two cache. And now with all these new generation of core microprocessors for the last 15 years or so, there, there has been added by Intel on the same silicon as the microprocessor, an L3, level three or last level, LLC means last level cache, LL3 cache. Now this LL3 cache is made up of SRAM type, very fast static RAM memory. It is again, part of the same silicon as the eight cores. And that, uh, that L3 cache amounts to a total amount of cache. Let me see, it says it here, the total amount of cache is in the order of 16 megabytes, 16 megabytes of L3 cache. Now it's limited. It's obviously not in the range of gigabytes, but its benefit is it's really fast. When the microprocessor fetches code or data from the DRAM, it puts it into that smaller cache and then executes from there at an order of magnitude faster than if you didn't have a cache and the microprocessor had to communicate with the DRAM all the time, right? So. External memory outside the microprocessor is called DRAM memory. It is slower than internal cache SRAM memory that's built into the microprocessor. Today's microprocessors have about 16 megabytes of cache memory. Now, as a user of a computer, you don't have a choice in picking the amount of cache. Intel decided that that's the cache size and that's the way it is. But a computer, you can upgrade with whatever amount of memory, DRAM memory that you buy to plug into the DIMM slots, okay? So that is upgradable. The DRAM DIMM memory is upgradable. The cache memory, because it's part of the silicon SRAM is not upgradable. Intel decided how much there is going to be for a given generation of microprocessor and you're stuck with that amount of cache memory, which Intel decided is the most effective cache size for now. Expect that future processors will have more of that cache but it's gonna be fixed amount. I hope I answered that question. Do we have any more pending questions? I think we have those two questions answered. All right, good. Now, I have finished talking about the microprocessor itself, which obviously is the brains of the computer, plus it includes, as I said, graphics and memory control. But there is this other chip that most people don't hear about, uh, which is equally important. Think of it as the body of the computer, not the brains, but the body, it's the interconnect. Think of it as the skeleton or the blood vessels, if you will, of the computer that allow the microprocessor to communicate with all the various peripherals, okay? And this chip is called a platform computer, or rather platform component hub, PCH. That's what it is. It is a single chip. Now, many years ago, there might've been multiple chips that make up the PCH. Currently, it's one single microprocessor that makes up, or rather it's one single silicon that makes up that PCH and that's shown there. Intel also designs it. And you will see that associated with this um, microchip is an audio controller, USB ports, Wi-Fi, flash ROM memory, and then PCI Express slots. These are all PCIe stands for PCI Express slots. And PCI Express slots allow you to plug in various different peripherals that are designed with a PCI Express interconnect in mind. Okay? So this PCH chip, Platform Component Hub, allows the microprocessor to communicate with audio, with USB peripherals, Wi-Fi, flash ROM, PCI Express, which connects to other other peripherals like ethernet, like storage, SSD, hard disk storage, 
or, or solid state drives um, or the legacy older uh, rotating hard drives, rotating media hard drives. Um, so that's what the PISA Express bus is for. It's a generic uh, uh, bus, high speed serial bus that allows communication between the PCH and the various peripherals that can plug into the various slots. And these slots are shown right here. These are PCI Express slots where you plug in PCI Express peripheral cards. You know, for example, one of the cards you can plug into that PCI Express slot is a graphics card, an external graphics card that a gamer would like to have on their desktop. Or maybe you could plug in a SSD external hard drive or a ethernet card for high speed uh, ethernet network communication and so on. Those are examples of peripherals that you can connect uh, externally via the PCH. Okay, now there is a we, bus. We have, yeah. Sorry, we have one more question. Uh, is the L3 SRAM cache only faster because it is part of the processor or does it use different, more complex technology than DRAM? Yes, both. The answer is both. It's faster because it's closer to the microprocessor. It's in the silicon of this same silicon as the microprocessor. That's one reason. But in addition, it uses SRAM technology with about, with about eight to 10 transistors per storage element, per bit of storage element versus DRAM that uses capacitors as its storage element. Now, the benefit of the DRAM is that it is for the, for the same amount of memory is it's much smaller. You can have in the same silicon, a ton of DRAM because there is only one transistor that the storage element is made up of. One bit, one transistor for DRAM, but for SRAM, one bit, 10 transistors, right? But it, this SRAM for the cache is way faster than the slower access time of the capacitor-based storage that DRAMs are made up of. So the answer is both. The reason why caches are fast is because they're in the same silicon and they're made out of SRAMs, which is an order of magnitude faster than the DRAMs, which are made out of capacitors, all right? All right, now, there is a protocol that Intel uses to communicate between processor and PCH. And that Intel refers to as DMI, but really it is PCI Express. So there is a PCI Express bus that connects these two chips together. And that bus is running at eight gigabits per second. It's a very fast bus, but it's a bus that you can't see. It's a connection between two microchips on the motherboard, all right? Uh, this slide explains that uh, a PCH has many PCI Express slots. It has many PCI Express slots, which, which we are visualizing there on the motherboard, and it allows you to connect many peripherals. That's the point, that you can connect many peripherals to the PCH. Okay, I'm skipping these slides. These are various form factors of the um, mechanical connector that is used to connect to the peripherals. We have the standard type connections that are shown here, but then you have form factors such as U.2 is one type of form factor. It's a mechanical connection to an external peripheral, or there's also the M2 form factor. M2 is typically used for connecting to SSD storage. So you can connect an M2 drive. Um, again, the protocol to communicate is PCI Express but the connector form factor could be standard PCI Express or U2 or M2, which are just names or technical names for the type of connector that you plug, use to plug in the peripheral to, okay? Skipping all of this. Um, here is flash memory, BIOS. You've heard of the term BIOS. When a microprocessor comes out of reset, when you power it on for the first time, it needs to execute code that is not yet in DRAM memory. And the code it executes at power on time is coming from flash memory, which has code that's burnt in and hard coded into that flash BIOS memory from there. So this code is fetched by the microprocessor and executed. Then with that code, the microprocessor gets to load the OS, which is contained on a hard drive. The operating system is contained on a hard drive and the hard drive could be 
plugged into a U2 slot or an M2 slot. That's where your hard drive will be plugged into. So we then load the operating system to the DRAM memory. And it is from there that the operating system will then load applications. And we are always running our code and applications from your DRAM memory. But when you power down a computer, all of that content is lost. So you power up a computer, the, so the processor will load flash code from the flash, which doesn't lose any code from there. It's flash memory or BIOS. And then that code will tell the microprocessor how to load uh, the operating system from the hard drive or SSD, which is plugged into a U2 or M2 slot. That code OS gets loaded into the DRAM, DDR memory. And from there, the microprocessor executes the OS, which then loads the applications into DRAM memory. The point you want to know is note is that code, runtime code is always running from DRAM memory. And then of course, as the processor fetches that code, it puts it into the cache and runs it from the cache. And when, when the cache fills up, it goes out to the DRAM, gets more code and replaces the code that already is in the cache with the code that comes from the DRAM memory. You always have the most recently accessed code in the cache and the less recently accessed code in the DRAM memory. Okay, so moving on, I'm gonna skip these slides because we're running out of time slowly. Then you have USB. USB, you've all seen, you have USB type A ports on your computer or you have these type C ports now. New computers have type C USB ports. USB stands for universal serial bus and USB is hot pluggable. Allows you to add external thumbnail drives, printers, monitors um, and other peripherals, cameras, video cameras, and so on. It allows you to plug those peripherals, hot plug, without having to power down the computer. It has the benefit of being a connector with a very small footprint on the side or the back of the computer. And it is a high-speed serial bus. Now, the controller for that USB is called an XHCI controller, and that's built into your PCH chip. The Wires from the XHCI control come out into the connector, which is the type A receptacle or type C receptacle, but the controller is built into PCH. And typically you might have 12 or so USB ports available on the PCH. Not all of them are necessarily used, but there are about 12 to 16 of them that the XHCI controller, host controller interface supports, all right? And then we have audio. The audio controller is built into the PCH, but the speaker and the A to D and D to A converter that converts digital to, to analog and analog to digital for the microphone. That A to D converter is an external chip, but the controller, digital controller is in, designed into the PCH. So again, remember, if anything you want to take out of this uh, function of the PCH, it is that it contains the controllers for the various peripherals that are going to be associated with the computer that the microprocessor communicates with via that PCH, okay? Now here is a laptop equivalent platform. Example number two. Now here is a laptop. This laptop is designed using the 10th generation microprocessor from Intel, a core i7 ice lake in this case. Ice Lake microprocessor, SOC stands for system on a chip. Let me explain what Intel did. In order to fit all of the hardware in a smaller form factor of a laptop, which is smaller than a desktop, what Intel did is combine on one SOC substrate, the microprocessor and the PCH, on a thumbnail size sub substrate. Now there are physically actually two chips still. That's the CPU and that's the PCH. But those two chips are wired together on a substrate of a fo smaller form factor, which then gets inserted, inserted into a, a motherboard that is used in a laptop. Now, in order to have all of this hardware fit in a smaller form factor, you will see there are fewer cores, four cores versus eight cores for a desktop, four cores. The assumption being that, you know, you want this silicon to be smaller, 
you want the substrate to be smaller and you want lesser power consumed at the expense of, well, not having the kind of performance you would get out of a desktop. So it has four cores, four threads of code can be executed concurrently versus a desktop that can execute eight threads of code concurrently, right? And by the way, Xeon microprocessors can have up to 32 or 64 cores today, uh, allowing you to execute 64 threads of code in parallel on a Xeon server microprocessor, okay? So you still have the same high level computer architecture, which is that there is a microprocessor and there is a PCH chip, but with the PCH, we are reducing the number of peripherals. We're paring down and removing a lot of pins and signals and reducing the number of devices you can connect to PCH. There are fewer PCI Express ports, um, one port for the SSD. Um, in other words, lesser interconnects, making the PCH much smaller and consuming less power. Look at the TDP for this processor and PCH. It's 15 watts versus 95 watts. This is intentional because you want this microprocessor and PCH to consume less power given that it will be powered potentially with a battery, right? So that is your SOC, system on a chip, right? System on a chip means two chips on one substrate to reduce the form factor size. All right, and that's a picture of the silicon. It shows built-in graphics, four cores, a memory controller, uh, graphics, and so on. Okay, now the graphics controller communicates via the DDI through an enhanced external display port to your laptop monitor. That's your laptop monitor or your flat panel display. EDP is the protocol. It's an enhanced uh, display port protocol for communicating with uh, flat panels. Okay, uh, USB, this USB is a spe special type of USB that supports power delivery. It's a USB type C port with the ability to power the laptop via the USB type C port. So traditionally USB was used simply for communicating with peripherals. Now you can also use it to power the laptop. And that's what PD stands for, power delivery. That the same port can, use, can be used to communicate with the peripheral externally or to power the laptop itself, okay? So you don't need an external connector, a special connector for power. USB can be used for that purpose. I see a question. Oh, uh, is this the question? It says, uh, I said L2 is larger than L1, how about L3? Yeah, so yes, L1 is typically the smallest size cache, but it's the fastest. L2 is a little bigger, but a little slower in performance than the L1. And the L3 is way bigger than the L2, but it's a little slower in performance compared to an L2. Uh, a typical size for L1 is, for example, 16 kilobytes, but it's the fastest. Typical size for L2 is about one megabyte, but it's a little slower than L1. And a typical size for L3 would be about 16 megabytes, but it's a little slower than L2. And so we have these three levels of cache in a microprocessor. And then beyond the cache outside is where you have your large amount of DRAM memory, okay? Ravi, we have one more quick question and we're slightly over time, but yep. if you'd like to answer this one, uh, someone said, my girlfriend likes to play older games, Sims 3, Minecraft. Unfortunately, these games only run on a single core. Do you think there will ever be a hardware solution for older software to leverage multiple cores? Uh, the answer is no, because in the end, um, unless the software is written, to be multi-threaded, it is only going to run on one core. So um, to take advantage of all the cores that you see in this case, in this picture, for example, you see there are four cores. The operating system is the one that sends each thread of code to each of those cores. So you need three applications to run on those three cores. Now, 
Typical applications are single threaded. If you want one application to run on multiple cores, you have to write it from scratch to be multi-threaded applications. Then the OS will schedule it to run on those cores. And so if you're running an older game, which is the application is already written, it's written to run on one core. And that's, that's it. Now, there is really no reason to run that application on multiple cores because there's only so much performance you want out of it, right? You won't be able to keep up with the game if it ran on multiple cores. So the answer is uh, legacy applications that are already written uh, for one core will always remain that way. And there is no way in hardware to try and take the instructions from that single application and send them to different cores. And there will not be a solution for that, okay? You have to write your application to be multi-threaded to take advantage of all the cores from the scratch. All right, moving on. We're almost done. So that showed you an example of a laptop architecture. And now keep in mind, I, I did say that the PCI Express bus is the type of bus used for communicating with the various peripherals, right? It's an important bus called PCI Express. This is the type of bus that has been around for 10 years, 20 years actually right now. And it's used by the microprocessor for communicating with peripherals. Now, what is new in future generation computers? Intel has introduced another bus, which is a next generation to PCI Express. This bus is called Compute Express Link CXL. You will start hearing that term a year to two years from now. Unless you Google it, um, you will not hear that term mentioned in any computers out there because there aren't any computers or microprocessors for that matter with CXL. They have all got PCI Express support, but not CXL. The future Intel processor coming out this year or next year is called Sapphire Ridge CPU. Now Sapphire Ridge will have every single aspect of the microprocessors we talked about so far which is it has DRAM support, PCI Express, the PCH will have USB and SATA and PCI Express and so on. But what Sapphire Ridge will add is this port called CXL, Compute Express Link. And it, the, these new microprocessors might have one or maybe four CXL links. Now CXL brings two features to an interconnect. One is it has even better performance than PCI Express. It will be able to run at clock rates or bandwidths of 32 giga transfers per second versus current day PCI Express, which is running at eight giga transfers per second. So CXL is going to be about four times the performance of PCI Express. But there's another key feature that it has, which is low latency communication. Low latency communication means that the time from when the microprocessor wants to access an external device till you actually talk to that external device is going to be reduced significantly. Okay, now what does that mean? Notice that our previous microprocessor had a memory controller. This is your memory control that supports, for example, 16 gigabytes of memory, okay? With CXL, I can add a second chip or a third chip in addition to PCH, another chip that has additional memory, additional DRAM memory. We're no longer limited to the DRAM memory on the microprocessor. You can have external DRAM memory on another chip and connected via CXL, but this memory will have a low latency access time, giving you a similar performance to the DRAM memory that is associated with the desktop, the microprocessor itself. In other words, a user will not be able to see any performance difference between the DRAM memory that's close to the microprocessor and the DRAM memory that is on another chip connected via CXL to the microprocessor. Now, what that allows you to do is have a computer with terabytes and terabytes of memory. 
Will you need that for home and, and home use desktop and laptop? No. CXL is designed for high-end servers, especially those used for AI processing. So your AI machines, artificial intelligence machines that needs terabytes and terabytes of memory will use CXL to communicate with external memory chips um, that are connected via CXL. That's what's coming down the pipe in the next few years, okay? I think I'll conclude my talk right now. Do you have any questions at this point? To anyone who has any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat. We have one right now, uh, I'll read it out. Thank you for a great talk and overview of the microprocessor architecture evolution in the last 35 to 40 years. Can we learn about your thoughts for the future, especially the packaging and manufacturing processes? Um, sorry. Uh, and ma manufacturing processes are getting close to the physical limits. Considering new technologies like quantum computing, do you see them as a threat to classical microprocessor architectures, especially if demonstrations of applications with quantum advantage increase quickly? Let's just say that um, Intel currently produces microprocessors designed on 10 nanometers. I mentioned that term 10 nanometers. Uh, there, there are other fabs uh, like TSMC, Taiwan Manufacturing Semiconductor Corporation, that is a little bit ahead of Intel. They have process technology that's about seven nanometers and then going to five and three nanometers and two nanometers. But as you point out, certainly, once we get to those tiny um, feature sizes, we're not going to be able to go to smaller feature sizes any longer. We have reached, or we are going to reach in the next few years, uh, we're going to reach a feature limit beyond which you cannot design microprocessors to be smaller. Of course, what that means is your silicon size will grow. We can, because we cannot make the transistors any smaller uh, because of the way light bends and so on, uh, you're going to have to make your silicon larger and larger. So we can add more complexity to a microprocessor, we can add more complexity to the silicon and we can add more transistors, but that will grow the silicon size. We won't be able to stick to a thumbnail size silicon. So there is still going to be room for growing computer architecture the way it is with evolutions of uh, features and hardware added to the computer. But that is still a standard von Neumann type computer. The overall computer architecture I've talked about is there to stay for a long time. Now, in parallel, people are talking about quantum computers that can execute uh, code at orders and orders of magnitude faster because of the way they do things, which is extremely different from standard von Neumann digital computers. However, quantum computing is still a very hypothetical research-based project in the lab. Google has some a quantum computer, IBM has a quantum computer, but they're all in the research phase. They are not manufacturable uh, in volumes. You cannot manufacture in volumes quantum computers. They're lab-based research environment or research computing platforms. They're not a threat. I don't see in the next 10, 15, 20 years at least, that's all I can see ahead. I don't see these, these quantum computers coming to the consumer marketplace anytime soon. So I think you're going to be seeing these von Neumann style Intel AMD ARM processor based, uh, microprocessor based computers for the foreseeable future. That's the short answer. Thank you for that answer. Um... Chen said, thank you very much for your sharing. This presentation includes much more information than I learned from my compu computer architecture course last semester. Oh. Um, we have many thank you messages in the chat. Great. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to ask. If not, that will be our end of our talk. Oh, wonderful. As I said, I am going to send Alper a PDF of this presentation. He will email them to you folks. Feel free to review it, use it for your personal use. And you can send me technical questions. You have an email 
address there. Okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, his contact details and additional resources will be in the event description of where you signed up for this talk on the labs.coday.org website. So feel free to check that out. I'll have that stuff up by the end of today. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.